So uh, welcome everyone uh, to uh, the last uh, lecture and seminar uh, uh, in the framework of our program uh, Feminist Art Institution. Uh, <coughs> at, uh, tonight we have with us uh, Giovanna Zaperi. Uh, who will speak about uh, the legacy of uh, Carla Lonzi, uh, an Italian uh, feminist. Uh, I will briefly introduce Giovanna. Uh, uh, Giovanna is an art historian and writer uh, based in uh, Paris. Uh, she, uh, she has been recently uh, appointed a professor uh, for contemporary art, uh, for contemporary art history at the Université de Tours in France, and she's the author of numerous uh, essays published in various uh, journals uh, and in various languages. Her latest book is um, entitled Carla Lanzi and Art of Life, and she's currently working on a collection of essays uh, entitled uh, Art and Feminism in post-war Italy together with Francesco Ventrella. And I invited Giovanna uh, because uh, I'm very much uh, excited about the legacy and the writings of Carla Lanzi. Uh, unfortunately, um, not many of her writings have been translated uh, to English or uh, German or other uh, languages. Uh, but uh, Giovanna <laughs> has the uh, she, she has the um, access to to all her uh, legacy and is, has been working uh, on it for some time. So I'm very very excited uh, to have her here and um, and uh, hear her lecture. And I also want to invite you to tomorrow's seminar, which takes place at our office at six. So thank you for coming. Thank you, uh, Giovanna, for coming to Prague and. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Teresa, for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. And thank you, everybody, for coming despite the heat today. <laughs> it's not really the kind of uh, day where you would go to a lecture. It's so hot. So thank you very much for being here. Um, OK, so my lecture today will be about Carla Lonzi, as Teresa announced it. and. Um, uh, more broadly, I want to look at this specific, this specific historical moment in Italian feminism, which is uh, the experience of the collective Rivolta Femminile. Do you hear me? Is that okay with the mic? Yes. Yeah. Um, the collective Rivolta Femminile, which means feminine revolt, and uh, uh, the writings of art critic and theorist Carla Lonzi, who was probably the most uh, charismatic uh, and important figure of uh, the group. Uh, and I want to try to look at uh, Rivolta Feminile as a possible experiment with the feminist uh, counter-institution or anti-institution. I will uh, explain why this notion of the institution is very problematic if we look at it with uh, uh, Carla Lonzi. I also, of course, want to underline the historical significance of Carla Lonzi's writing and uh, also to think the entwinement in her writings between uh, artistic questions, between the question of creativity of art and uh, politics feminism. So more specifically for this lecture today, I will focus on Carla Lonzi's writings in the wake of 1968, and I will also briefly speak about the 1968 upheaval in Italy and at the beginning of the women's movement, so the years between 68 and 72 uh, are very important for uh, Italian history, but also for Carla Lonzi's writings and becoming. Why? Because with the beginning of the feminist movement in 1970, Carla Lonzi decided that she didn't want to be an art critic anymore, and uh, she decides to fully engage in feminism. But uh, uh, despite this rupture in her biography, I want to stress the interrelation between these two moments 
our criticism and feminism against the idea that uh, Lonzi's feminism is totally disconnected from her previous activity as an art critic, and I will explain it a bit uh, in, a, in, a, in a bit. Um, also, I want to focus on the way she responds to the students' revolts in 1968 and on the practice that she and other women inaugurated uh, in Italy in the early 70s, which is called autocoscienza, which is a kind of Italian version for consci consciousness raising, um, which means something like self-consciousness raising, a uh, practice that was adopted by most of Italian feminist groups around 1970. <clears throat> and also since this lecture series interrogates the possibility of a feminist art institution, I want to propose to read Autocoscienza as an attempt to imagine a feminist autonomous space, uh, a space for women's autonomy in which the institutional logic of power is challenged. But first of all, let me introduce uh, who Carla Lonzi was, because I'm sure not everyone is familiar with her work here. So Carla Lonzi was born in 1931. She died in 1982, quite young, at uh, 51. Uh, she was an Italian art critic, a feminist, a writer, and also a poet. And yet, as someone who struggled against such categories in their power to reduce life to a sum of roles and identities, any attempt to define her activity will inevitably remain provisional and incomplete. I would say that Lonzi experimented with ways of writing differently in the context of 1960s and 70s Italian culture, when the country's social structures were put under pressure by a growing contestation and the mass feminist movement. The feminist movement was really huge in Italy, and also the 68 lasted for uh, almost a decade, until 1977, uh, with uh, a number of uh, antagonistic uh, revolts and groups, etc. So it was really a period of, turmoil, of political turmoil in Italy. So through the creative process of writing, Carla Lonzi strived at undoing the roles that she linked to her oppression while constantly trying to articulate her subjective experience within a collective endeavor. Around 1970, the separatist group, so the women's group, became for her the site of the collective constitution of the subject, which is itself a collective work in process. Her early feminist interventions of 1970, such as Let's Spit on Hegel, perhaps the most uh, um, well-known well title, called for a cultural revolution based on the woman's becoming a subject. The intertwining of the creative process of becoming a subject and the shared experience of liberation is precisely what connects Lonzi's feminism to her art writings. Okay, this is just to give you a... Uh, in 1969, Carla Lonzi published this book called Autoritratto, which means self-portrait in Italian, which is a book based on the principle of montage, consisting of a series of tape-recorded conversations transcribed and assembled. So between 1965 and 1969, Carla Lonzi had recorded conversations, like one-to-one -one conversations, with 14 Italian artists, all listed uh, in the book cover, and all of those artists were male, except one, which is Carla Cardi, painter Carla Cardi. So each conversation is recorded, then um, fragmented, and then recomposed in a non-linear ensemble, where Lonzi ceases to ask questions or discuss the artist's work, but where she speaks for herself in her own voice. And you can see it, okay, it's in Italian, but this is the second page of the book where you can see all the voices that will speak throughout the book, so every artist, you know, and that she mixed them together, so as if they were having a conversation together, which is of course a fiction. So she constructs the fiction of an uninterrupted conversation in which her role is the one of uh, participation, I would say. Mm -hmm. So once the original continuity of the conversations is destroyed, 
Lonzi composes a text in which she and the artist converse, so to speak, with each other. Lonzi had also requested the artist to send her pictures, so that the ongoing conversation is punctuated with a number of illustrations, so that um, thereby simulating sorry, the traditional text image format of artistry books. The majority of these images, however, are personal or travel snapshots. Only a small number reproduce artworks. As you can see, they uh, show like artists in their homes, with their families, as children, etc., etc. And there are, there are no chapters in the book, so it's a continuing text. It's a 300 pages text. So the pictures present throughout the book provides a subjective element within the discussions that comprise the text. Lonzi quite literally undoes both the practices and the poetics of art writing hegemonic at her time. She abandons the authority of interpretation in order to participate in the creative moment, while focusing on subjectivity and non-hierarchical exchanges also undermines the primacy of the image, of the visual, as one of formalism epistemic foundations. The book is also a farewell to the art world and to art criticism, an activity she had pursued for over a decade. Carlonzi had been an important art critic throughout all the 1960s, working uh, in uh, proximity with all the famous arte povera artists, uh, such as Lucio, uh, Luciano Fabro, Pascali, Paolini, etc. In 1970, together so with the only woman artist participating in the autoritratto conversation, Carla Cardi, um, they uh, founded together a Rivolta Femminile, Feminine Revolt, which was one of the very first feminist groups in Italy. And Rivolta Femminile from the beginning uh, inaugurated this practice of autocoscienza and uh, constituted itself as a separatist group, so men were not allowed in the meetings. For Lonzi, there was no possible reconciliation between her previous activity as an art critic and her engagement as a feminist, a fact that has contributed to the representation of her life and career as dramatically bifurcated. Lonzi, who died in 1982 at the age of 51, is one of the founding figures of Italian second wave feminism and the author of a number of provocative texts and manifestos here is a collection of the original uh, covers. Sputiamo su Hegel is perhaps the most famous text she wrote, Let's Spit on Hegel in 1970, uh, The Clitoral Woman and the Vaginal Woman, 1971, Feminine Sexuality and Abortion, also 1971, etc. In 1978, she published her diary, her private journal, under the title um, Taci and si parla, which means like shut up, rather speak. Uh, this contradiction, a feminist diary, subtitle. In 1980, she published uh, Vai Pure, Now You Can Go, a dialogue with Pietro Gonzaga. Uh, the book, the, this book, again, it's, um, it's uh, based on a conversation that she had with uh, Pietro Consagra, who was her partner for uh, almost 20 years. And this is a four days dialogue uh, which kind of records the crisis in the relationship. Uh, and Consagra was an artist also, who also was participating in Autodrato 10 years earlier. So these texts are not only among the most important documents of Italian feminism, they also represent feminist experiments with writing, creativity and knowledge production. In this text, Lonzi reinvents a number of traditionally minor forms of expression, such as the private journal, the conversation or the manifesto. Moreover, Lonzi's program of deculturation chronicles a search for female autonomy that challenges an inclusive ambition to be part of an already written history. In her anti-dialectical understanding of historical time, history itself is understood as a male construction from which women are structurally excluded. As she writes in Let's Spit on Hegel, Feminism interrupts both chronological continuity and the monologue of patriarchal history. 
Her own path reflects, in a way, her theorization of feminism as a discontinuity. And it is impossible to read her intellectual and political trajectory using a linear and homogeneous historical framework. Rather, her break with pre-existing epistemological paradigms should be considered in terms broader than those of biographical perspectives as a contested and yet productive side for present reflection. So, Tella Lonzi's writings have been a constant reference in Italian feminism since the 1970s. Their ability to invent a language of one's own in contrast with established critical traditions such as Marxism or psychoanalysis or emancipationist, which were dominant in the antagonistic vocabulary of the 1960s, was crucial in this process. The experimental nature of her writings, their fragmentary structure, reflects the unfinished process of becoming a subject. In addition, the persistent search for autonomous forms of expression in Lonzi's work inevitably resists any attempt to systematically categorize her production. So let's go back to 1970, the moment in which Carla Lonzi abandoned the artwork right after the publication of Autoritratto in the um, in the fall of 1969, and decide to fully engage in feminism. So my idea is that her withdrawal did not mean that she ceased to reflect about art and its patriarchal structures. On the contrary, her critique of art plays a crucial role in the process of imagining a new feminist vocabulary. Lonzi's experience at the forefront of the Italian avant-garde was crucial in her subsequent experimentations of alternative forms of life, creativity, and being together that she pursued throughout the 1970s. Carla Lonzi's feminism involves a number of aspects that are strongly connected to her previous activity as an art critic. As she elaborated, some of the concepts that were soon good to be translated in a new feminist vocabulary. Her ideas about the artist's autonomy and authenticity, her notion of culture as a repressive force, the emphasis on relations and the critique of authority within the art field are crucial to her feminism. In particular, Lonzi's critique of art considered as a sum of institutions, power relations, and forms of sociability is the basis upon which she will develop her feminist practice. Her continuous search for valuable forms of disobedience against the patriarchal organization of life is based upon the refusal to comply with the male mechanism of reputation and success. Lonzi's desire to establish non-hierarchical relations and communities explicitly counters the patriarchal emphasis on competition and success. Lonzi's withdrawal is thus not merely a stepping aside, rather it becomes a challenging project engaging a desire for transformation in which life and creativity can exist in radically new ways. Lonzi's writing from the late 60s and early 70s demonstrate the significance of her withdrawal from art for her elaboration of a feminist subjectivity. In 1963 already, she wrote a very polemical text entitled La Solitudine del Critico, The Critic's Loneliness. Uh, this text was really uh, an attack against the way art criticism was mostly practiced in Italy at that time, uh, a way that she considered uh, institutional and based on a hierarchies, based on judgment and on a hierarchical relation between the, the critic and the artist. Mm -hmm. So already in 1963, she had started to question the relation between artists and critics as based on a power differential. And I quote her, with an abuse of power, the critic denies what constitutes the liberatory potential of an artistic research, namely the realization of an absolute lack of hierarchies and directive roles, end quote. According to Lonzi, the artist's freedom lies in the lack of identification with the social role 
This is very important, but also in the artist's indifference to power. And maybe I have to, um, to just uh, give an, a small note that all translations are mine. Some of them I did very quickly, so they might sound a bit strange. Uh, also, um, Carla Lonzi's prose is very uh, peculiar. It's, uh, she's really like a, more like a literary writer, so it's very difficult to translate. Also, the role played by spoken language is very strong. Uh, so, please forgive the inaccuracy of the quotes that, quotes that I have uh, copied here, just to give you an idea. Uh, it's also very powerful uh, writing, actually, very difficult in, in, case for, in any case for me to, to translate. Okay, so 1968. Huh? Um, Carla Lonzi both participated in the, in the revolts of 1968, but at the same time she was um, suspicious of it. Huh? And actually her mistrust in 1968 political turmoil is similarly rooted in her rejection of the logic of power, which she already started to question uh, within the framework of the relation between artists and critics. <coughs> Actually, in Autoritratto, in the book Self-Portrait, uh, conversations among artists often address the revolts, mm? the revolts that were growing across Italian universities, factories, but also art institutions. And these revolts were questioned mostly from the point of view of the artist's freedom and of the notion, of course, of the, of the modernist notion of autonomy was very uh, strong for them. The occupation of the Triennale in Milan in May 1968, which prompted the, clo the closure of the exhibition, was followed a few weeks later in June 1968 by the occupation and the uprisings, mostly during the, the opening of the Venice Biennale. And uh, okay, these are so, some documents. Uh, these uh, uprisings prompted some artists to either withdraw their artworks or to cover them, uh, the artworks uh, that they featured in the main exhibition of the Biennale. Protesters particularly targeted the art institution's conservatism and inadequacy and the inadequacy of the exhibition format they proposed, a position which inevitably involved the artist and their role in society. There was a widespread concern about art's commodification and the ways in which the creative labor was increasingly subordinated to market's imperatives. In Autoritratto, however, Lonzi expresses her belief in the artist's ability not to identify with a role, a category, or a profession. This was for her a key component of the artist's autonomy from the institutional mechanism of power. The artists participating in the book's conversation show a similar understanding of autonomy as a form of resistance against the power dynamics of culture. The artists participating in the books, uh, sorry, the uprisings thus became a way for the artists to question the relation between art and life, the power of the institution and the role of the artist in society. It is interesting to note that their positions often take a defensive stand against the, against the accusation that came from section of the protest, from the majority of the protesters actually, of the artists being accommodated with power in the end. So Enrico Castellani, one of the artists who speaks in the book and who was also very much present during the uprisings both in Milan and in Venice and who was a Marxist, uh, argues, for example, in the book, and I quote, that the contestation was not directed against artists as such. The charge was always against power and against the structures in which the oppressive side of power becomes recognizable, end quote. From his perspective, power always identifies with the institutions, such as the Venice Biennale, in which art's subversive potential is channeled and neutralized. In line with her participation in the Venice Biennale's occupation, Lonzi identifies institutional power with the role of the art critic, a role that she is trying to undermine and that she will eventually abandon. 
On the other side, she can't really adhere to the protest, which, in her opinion, fails to fully acknowledge art's revolutionary potential. Lodzi also rejects its Marxist premises and the ambition to overthrow institutions by taking command instead of just abandoning institutions altogether. Two years later, in Let's Spit on Hegel, so in 1970, Lonzi will explicitly affirm feminism and distance from Marxist ideologies of her time, precisely because of her refusal to play within the logic of institutional power. Interestingly, this point is developed through a thoughtful discussion of the differences and similarities between politicized students and the more disengaged hippies. Both in Autoritratto and in uh, Let's Spit on Hegel, Lonzi manifests her interest for the hippies' communities, which in her view represent a valuable alternative to the revolutionary students. Hippies aim at experimenting alternative forms of life, unlike the students, whose aspirations are mainly directed towards the conquest of power. In Autoritratto, Lonzi explains that students are, I quote, less creative and older in their head because they are politicized. On the contrary, she finds hippies far more attractive because of their rejection of the conventions of bourgeois life, consisting in choosing a lifestyle marked by a greater freedom. And here I quote Lonzi from the book. She says, the hippie is searching for a way to live you understand, this is something very different that I really like. Students are political, they see a situation, but they don't think that the most important thing is themselves and to live the way they want." End quote. <clears throat> the student and the hippie crisscross both Autoritratto and Let's Spit on Hegel, where we find this comparison yet again. They actually indicate two distinctive forms of life in Lonzi's view. The first one is focused on power, while the second one promotes freedom, creativity and participation. Also, hippie's lifestyle shows a possible alternative to the idea that the aesthetic is a socially separate sphere. Their transformation of everyday life is connected to a critique of power, as opposed to the students' revolutionary politics. Also, Lonzi is interested in the hippies' communities because they are concerned with a, with a subjective experience of transformation, of change, and they don't try to participate in the making of history, so they don't pose themselves as protagonists, in a way. As Pietro Consagra also explains in the book, what differentiates students from hippies, which he considers actually far more uh, uh, similar to artists, is the refusal to understand their activity in terms of roles and categories. And here I quote uh, Pietro Gonzaga briefly, who says, this is a way to withdraw from the categories and to insert themselves in life. Their attitude takes the side of life. So the student should insert himself into society through more trenchant actions that could be exemplary of the life experience of a young person, instead of presenting the, themselves as a category, the students, with all the ensuing problems and difficulties that this condition entails." Unquote. So the hippie provides a model for liberation based on a subjective transformation, which which was far more interesting in Lonzi's eyes than the students' attempt to modify social structures from the outside. It is no coincidence, so, that the hippies reappear in Let's Spit on Hegel, yet again in opposition to the politicized student, who has now become a contender for the role of the oppressor. A specific feature that attracted Lonzi is their transgression of gender roles. They experiment, she says, non-masculine kind of communities. They refuse to, to separate the public and the private spheres, which is, of course, a very crucial point for uh, the way she understands feminism, or for 1970s uh, feminism in general. 
Hippies for long the epitomize a gender trouble in which male and female attitudes and behaviors could coexist. Her fascination for the hippies suggests her simultaneous shift from art criticism towards the collective experimentations that she's, she is elaborating around 1968. In her own experience, the imagined community emerging from the late 60s, from late 60s, sorry, youth culture, opens up the path of a becoming which takes the shape of a shared political project. So in this respect, Lonzi's interest for these alternative communities relates to both autoritratto, to what she's constructing in the book, this idea of, a of an artist community and of a way of uh, practicing art criticism which is not based on a situation of, on a power differential, but which is based on a circulation of uh, the conversation and, of, and on the relation uh, that exists among uh, the different subjects. And also to the feminist practice of autocoscienza that she's about to inaugurate at that point. So autocoscienza were women-only meetings based on speech acts and mutual listening as part of, the, of a collective dynamics in which the individual experience could connect to the collective struggle for liberation. After 1970, most of Italian feminist groups adopted autocoscienza as the ground upon which to build separatist politics and practice. What came out of it was, among other things, a new awareness of the constitutively political dimension of what happened in the personal sphere. The definition of a separate space was crucial in the Rivolta Feminile's understanding of autocoscienza. A short text, collectively written in 1972, which means that it was signed Rivolta Feminile, although uh, we can assume that it was mostly Carla Lonzi who wrote uh, the text, I mean, all the texts that were signed collectively, because it's really her style and her expressions. Um, it's a short text entitled The Meaning of Autocoscienza in Feminist Groups. In this text, uh, the collective affirms that this new practice marks the historical space where woman becomes a subject of her own, thus preparing the ground for her autonomy. And here another short quote from uh, this 1972 text. The feminist groups practicing autocoscienza acquired their real feature as nuclei capable of transforming the spirituality of the patriarchal era. They operate the women's becoming a subject, that, uh, sorry, the women's becoming a subject as women mutually recognize themselves as complete human beings which are no longer in need of approval from men. And here also the expression that she uses are very difficult to translate. What I badly translated becoming subject is uh, she uses a word that is more like a, like a jump, like like a jump into subjectivity or like something when you take a picture, something that is very quick and uh, unexpected, another crucial, uh, important notion for um, Lonzi. So this uh, imagina imaginary community of autoritratto where, um, as I said, the conversations would ha were held in reality one-to-one, -one, and then she creates this fiction you know, of a collective uh, situation which did not exist in reality, you know, so it was imaginary. So this idea of a community that took shape during the fabrication of Autoritratto is now translated in the reality of a political practice based on a participatory self-transformation. The book's fragmentation of the subject takes now the shape of a recomposition in which each woman is empowered through her connection to the others. Whereas Autoritrato had enabled Lonzi to become aware of the mechanism of social identification sustaining art institutions, Autocoscienza marked a creative moment of withdrawal from the same mechanism. 
In 1971, Lonzi writes, for example, that feminism is what allows each woman to find the collective female consciousness in which to elaborate the subject of her liberation. End quote. Meetings took, took place in private home, often in Lonzi's apartment in Milan. Uh, this is a picture of, the, of Lonzi's apartment, which is published in one of Rivolta Feminile's collective books, uh, which had also an economy iconographic apparatus, and I found it interesting that uh, in the book you often see uh, the different women participating in the, um, uh, in the meetings and you see the spaces, but you always see the spaces empty, so there is a, an idea that the visual is not the locus to the place, the way to represent autocoscienza. Mm -hmm. Which, uh, which has to do with the primacy of, the, um, of language and of the presence also. So those uh, private spaces became a new type of space, where the boundaries between the private and the public were redefined. Separatism is an indispensable feature within the process of mutual recognition prompted by those meetings, where women's experience becomes politically relevant. Unlike other groups, however, that gathered in uh, semi-public, let's say, spaces such as uh, women's book bookstores, uh, mostly, so spaces that were more permeable and open to the outside, uh, Rivolta Feminile's practice is marked by an ambivalent refusal of the public sphere. Uh, so the group became more and more uh, closed uh, towards the exterior. After the first two years of existence between 1970 and 1972, it became uh, a, a closed circle, so it was not so easy to participate in the groups if one were not already uh, part of it, let's say. And like what happened, for example, in Libreria delle Donne in Milan, in the Milan's women's bookstore, which was a bookstore, so which was a place where women could go, and there was not this uh, a strong sense of um, belonging that you had in Rivolta, which was also uh, probably a problem. Um, yeah, so the choice to meet in private homes emphasizes both the domestic as the space of female experience uh, and the refusal to compromise with any entrenched institutional form. Autocoscienza actually induced a radical reconfiguration of the private and the public, inasmuch as it took place in a secured space where it was possible both to experiment new relations among women and to develop the group's political and theoretical work. Autocoscienza was based on horizontality of non-hierarchy and individual speech acts, but there was also a lot of listening, a lot of silence. Conflicts were equally present, present as they constantly resurfaced in the traditional forms of competitions, roles, antagonism that were negotiated collectively. And in her journal, uh, Carla Lonzi constantly um, describes those conflicts, constantly describes the difficulty of occupying a role of the one who is the, mo the main the figure who writes most, who has written those very important texts, etc., and the struggles that that produces within this uh, shared space. So, uh, in the end, autocoscienza is really a space where conflicts uh, played out between women. Mm. Um, most importantly, autocoscienza functions as a process in which self-affirmation, collective knowledge, and mutual recognition are bound together through the constitution of a different community. This feminist utopia of the articulation between the individual and the collective, as uh, feminist historian Luisa pa Passerini has put it, becomes the basis upon which women constitute themselves as political subject. Lonzi underlines this point in a text written a bit later in uh, 1977, where she muses on the experience of autocoscienza. You have to know that by then, by the end of the 70s, autocoscienza was not practiced anymore. It's really something that was developed in the early 70s and which was very complicated to uh, establish uh, on a duration. 
for many reasons. Uh, maybe one could, could say that it failed to establish itself as something that could last, uh, but still it was a very strong moment of, uh, of uh, self-constitution as a political subject. So by 1977 the group didn't practice an autocoscience anymore and Lonzi goes back to this, to, to this moment in this text called um, an itinerary of reflection, something like that, where she writes, I quote, the consciousness of myself as a political subject is born out of the group from the realization that has taken the form of a non-ideological collective experience. Our success in rendering this group possible has given us the measure of our capacity to withdraw from male strategies and structures, to free ourselves from their oppressive power, to begin to exist for what we are. This is just the first step, but its nature is political. We understood that it what it means to be together, to enhance what we are instead of betraying ourselves. The group allowed us to live a sense of completeness that we have missed historically, as we have always been considered as secondary creatures." End quote. So here we see some of the um, key terms uh, in Lonzi's thinking and the key practices. Of course, the, the idea of withdrawal is very important since in the moment where she withdraws from the profession of the art critic, she also withdraws from the idea that one can be identified with the profession, with the role, uh, with the role that then is going to uh, orient your, uh, decide your relations with the other people, with the people you work with, and that puts you already in a hierarchical scheme, let's put it this way. So, women's autonomy takes as its starting point what is made possible by autocoscienza, a collective withdrawal from the structures of social and cultural identification. So, withdrawal is also a form of disidentification from traditionally female uh, women's role, for example. The feminist group enacts a creative potential in developing a new way of doing politics. Autocoscienza has no pre-established rules, no leader, no control, but an integral openness towards the other. Lonzi particularly insists on the fact that autocoscienza cannot be recuperated as culture, nor as an institution, I would add, because it doesn't turn to man, it doesn't speak to man. On the contrary, it originates in what she calls a void, where an autonomous sense of the self can grow and exist. Autocoscienza is how women collectively challenge patriarchal notions of subjectivity. So for Lonzi, feminism also involves the facts of life, or mainly involves what happens in one's life, and the conflicts, of course, that are part of it. In her early feminist writings, she often uses the term deculturation with, with reference to the possibility of undoing the ways in which culture determines women's behavior and self-perception. Accordingly, she argues for a fundamental opposition between life and culture. Deculturation was a crucial buzzword in 1960s and 70s political jargon. But the way Lenzis uses this term encompasses the political as well as the artistic spheres. Woman's autonomy takes as its starting point her refusal of culture as ideology and power, thus recalling Lenzis' attempt to speak about art without the mediation of art criticism institutional language. Between 1968 and 1970, the process of disidentification from a set of established roles enables the emergence of a new subjectivity that Lonzi called the clitoral woman. The clitoral woman makes her first appearance in Lonzi's 1971 text called La donna clitoridea e la donna vaginale, the clitoral woman and the vaginal woman, where the question of sexual autonomy is connected to the wider framework of women's liberation. This figure, the clitoral woman, embodies the possibility to withdraw from the roles that traditionally define femininity. 
Conversely, the vaginal woman, so the opposite pole of femininity, fully identifies as woman, thus becoming the epitome of patriarchal oppression. The clitoral woman suggests that this identification from established gender norms has to be understood as a creative process in which the subject can express herself beyond the conventions of gender normativity. This process begins with the affirmation of an autonomous sexuality. The clitoral woman claims her own sexual pleasure against the patriarchal ideal of a docile and reproductive sexuality. Lonzi affirms the need to withdraw from patriarchal sexuality as the latter is both understood in existential and in political terms. This doesn't necessarily coincide with the refusal of heterosexuality as such. It marks instead a different understanding of women's sexual expression. Lonzi's description of the clitoral woman recalls in many ways her ideas about the artist's autonomy from social convention. However, now the project of autonomy is understood in terms of an endless process and not as a condition, the one of the artist, entailing also a form of privilege. Most importantly, this new subjectivity is grounded in a disobedient sexuality that defies the patriarchal organization of social relations. Starting from this new positioning, Lonzi's feminism translates a shift from art towards a refusal of culture as a whole. This already emerges in the first manifesto of Rivolta Feminile, which was uh, written collectively in the spring of 1970 and what took really the form of a manifesto that they hung uh, in the streets in Rome and in Milan um, in the spring-summer 1970. This is the original uh, version. So in this manifesto, which is composed of a series of brief this is translated into English brief affirmations. Uh, one can read also that woman's autonomy begins with the awareness of her own difference and with the unmasking of the ties that link culture and patriarchy. Accordingly, a practice of withdrawal marks the moment in which culture is rejected altogether. And here is a short quote. By not recognizing herself in male culture, woman deprives it of the illusion of universality. Man's strength lies in identifying with culture, ours in refuting it." End quote. Rivolta Feminile's program of deculturation represents a necessary step towards autonomy in the framework of a collective process in which culture's institutional apparatus is revealed. In Autoritratto, Lonzi had attempted to undo established forms of art writing as part of a process that had led her to consider art criticism knowledge production as a power operation based on observation, aesthetic judgment, and on hierarchical relations. She had deemed art criticism institutional expertise as an act of domination and control over those who find themselves in the position of being the object of an inquiry, namely the artist. The word culture refers now to the whole apparatus through which ideology operates in all its ramifications, including social relation, academic knowledge, and now art, but also religion, as well as the, the whole moral values upon which the social order is secured and, of course, family, reproduction, and sexuality, above all. So in Let's Spit on Hegel, Lonzi writes that feminism is neither the opposite of culture, but it's, not, it's neither an ideology. It marks instead a different positioning. And here I quote Lonzi, who writes, the mode of action we choose is the shedding of our culture. It is not a cultural revolution that follows and integrates the economic revolution. It is not based on the verification at all levels of an ideology, but on the lack of ideological necessity. Woman has opposed the construction to the construction of man only her existential dimension. She has not had generals, thinkers, and scientists. Instead, she, had had, she has had 
energy, thoughts, courage, attentiveness, common sense, and madness." End quote. So here, it's interesting that Lonzi enumerates an array of mythicized male role, the scientist, the conductor, the general, etc., to which she opposes a series of knowns referring to the spheres of sensations, of experience, of subjectivity. Autonomy is in fact integral to a wider process in which the roles defining woman as a secondary formation in relation to man are unraveled. For Lonzi, woman's autonomy and agency are unfinished process, starting with the refusal to comply with the structures of social and cultural identification. In Autoritratto, for example, Lonzi had already defined her education as an art historian, as a student, as bureaucratic, she says, and repressive. After graduating from the University of Florence, she was a brilliant student, as you can imagine, she refused to consider an academic career, which her advisor uh, proposed her to think about it or to, come to start to publish in academic journals. And she chose to become an art critic because she thought this would allow her to address the interrelated issues of freedom and knowledge as she explains in a conversation during Autoritratto, which I quote, where she says, art criticism should be an activity that involves individuals that, like myself, want the more profound initiation than the one provided by culture." End quote. So a few months later, in Let's Spit on Hegel, Lonzi would clearly indict higher education for its complicity with women's oppression. Um, and here I quote her again. Colleges and universities are not places where young women are liberated through culture, but places where the repression is perfected, the same repression that is so well cultivated within the family. The education of a young woman consists in slowly injecting her with the poison that paralyzes her just as she is on the verge of the most potentially responsible actions of the experiences that might increase her self-confidence." So here there is really the idea of a continuity between uh, family and institution uh, in uh, constituting woman like as an already available product, as, um, uh, as, a, product as, a, as a figure that is um, secondary to man. Uh, and I think this um, this invocation of a poison that immobilizes the young woman, uh, it's, a, it's a powerful image that uh, suggests the bodily consequences of those forms of institutional knowledge production from which Lonzi was precisely escaping. Culture's paralyzing effects are analogized with the image of a petrified subject, a subject that is unable to act, constrained in a set of roles of stereotypes. This mechanism, which contributes to the alienation of women from their bodies, uh, this uh, bodily image of the paralysis, and also from their sexuality, of course, need to be undone in search for those unexpected gestures opening the path towards autonomy and freedom. So in order to escape paralysis, women thus have to interrupt the circle of repetitions in which they are trapped this involved the assumption of roles, stereotypes, categories, and identifications that both oppress and define femininity. In this respect, a practice of deculturation corresponds with the process of becoming a subject, in which women dare to abandon what they thought they knew about themselves. In the end, for Lonzi, autonomy means the challenge of no longer being recognizable as women. So, of refusing the identification as women. Uh, she writes in, uh, um, I think it's Let's Spit on Hegel. No, it's the clitoral woman, sorry. Men don't know who the woman is as soon as she exits, of course, as she abandons his colonization, as she uh, leaves his colonization and the roles that prepared an experience established across the centuries the mother, the virgin, the wife, the lover, the daughter, the sister, the sister-in-law, the friend, and the prostitute. 
Woman was a ready-made product, and there was nothing to discover in this human being. Each role presented its own warranties. To withdraw from those roles, therefore, meant the end of man's consideration. It was the end." Unquote. So the danger to fall outside of man's attention means that women might be exposed to punishment, revenge, and the stigma connected to the feeling of one's inadequacy to comply to male criteria. Against the risk of losing all they knew about themselves, Lonzi opposes the power of creativity, which is the other side, so to say, of her withdrawal. This is perhaps the most important and yet less explored aspect within the constellation of meanings revolving around the possibility to disidentify from social roles. However, the process consisting in undoing gender roles, role, sorry, could also shift into a paradoxical production of new forms of identification. If patriarchy constructs woman as an already available product, Lonzi's argument sometimes suggests that this identification could lead to a pre-existing identity. This is perhaps the reason why when Lonzi describes the clitoral woman, she repeatedly makes reference to creativity, as she had experienced it in the art world, when she was mostly interested in works that focused on process and experience rather than on visual objects. Terms such as creativity, creative search, imagination, self-expression are recurrent in the clitoral woman and the vaginal woman as they make reference to the notion of autonomy. Creativity thus emerges as an indispensable feature to think woman's disidentification as part of a transformative practice that primarily involves the affirmation of an autonomous sexuality. References to creativity also suggest the interrelated issues of desire and subjectivity as crucial formations in the process described by Lonzi. Indeed, the vaginal woman has given away her own creativity, according to Lonzi, in order to put it at the service of male demands. And this is why, she writes, she never finds the courage to want a creative experience for herself which is above all self-concentration." Conversely, the clitoral woman's autonomous creativity suggests the idea of the unexpected subject, a notion that Lonzi coins in Let's Spit on Hegel, giving rise to those, quote, imaginative potential that woman confidently takes on for herself, end quote. The notion of the unexpected subject allows to understand the liberation from social roles in the framework of a collective making of a feminist subject. In the already mentioned text on autocoscienza, Rivolta Feminile writes that, quote, only through an unexpected act, which means free, woman can escape her role as object, whereas free means that she doesn't count on someone else for her redemption, end quote. So the unexpected gesture indicates woman's agency against and in spite of her oppression as the only way to avoid the trap represented by the illusion induced by the promises of equality, which are nothing but, in the words of Lonzi, Lonzi a tragic form of travesty of male power like any other form of colonization." End quote. This is a decisive argument since it concerns the very possibility to inhabit a space in which relations among women are not predicated on the imitation of male standards. And this is the critique of equality that comes from, uh, let's say, a differentialist feminism. For this reason, autocoscienza is, is the opposite of an institution as it abolishes roles and identifications turning towards women existences as the locus of their subjectivation. The writings of Carla Lonzi and the history of Rivolta Feminile show how this experiment was challenging and merciless for the women involved in it. We can still wonder about the strength, the weakness and the complications of autocoscienza 
and ultimately its failure in proposing a valuable alternative to established institutional models. However, I believe its creative potential in experimenting a feminist practice of liberation can still resonate today as we try to imagine alternative forms of feminist institutions. Thank you very much. Because it seems that uh, the space of uh, that uh, Lonzi was searching uh, for something in art, and she was uh, searching for that very thing. It also in the she was like oh, the whole time searching for one one thing. Uh, first it was in art, and then in the mm -hmm. feminist uh, um, collective or the process. And um, when you spoke about the uh, this and uh, this. Maybe you could elaborate more on what uh, art was for Lonzi, because when you spoke about uh, this, the process of disidentification and withdrawal from the social roles, um, it resonated uh, a bit with the idea of alienation uh, and so somehow, you know, see, seeing uh, your life or uh, uh, from a distance. Is it something that she was also expecting, uh, or is, does it resonate with her ideas about about art? It's this whole dis dis identification and withdrawal. Is it something that uh, uh, that also in an aesthetic that you uh, that uh, you that you that she would wish uh, for for the experience for the ex art experience to kind of deliver, or um, this kind of alienation and kind of that leads to this kind of liberation and something like that? Um, well, this was, uh, well, let me um, try to go back. Okay, when she's uh, working on the project of Autoritratto, Carla Lonzi is um, focusing less and less on the artworks. Okay, she was interested in those kind of uh, works of the 1960s that uh, questioned and challenged the, the institutional spaces of the galleries, also the traditional formats, etc. Uh, and also challenged the, a formalist approach to it, which was still very strong in Italy. It was probably the only available vocabulary for art criticism, but was still uh, related in a way to formalism. And on the other side, she's contesting also art criticism that is related to, um, to uh, Marxist ideas. Uh, also, you have to um, understand that uh, in Italy in the 1960s, uh, the Communist Party was very strong. It was very strong until the 80s, I would say. It had like 40% or something like that. And that the cultural field was very much related to the Italian Communist Party. So if you, if you were an intellectual, an art critic or an artist, you, there was this network connected to the, to the Communist Party. So the Communist Party had an hegemony uh, in culture. And this is also maybe helps to explain uh, the um, antagonism that Lonzi has, which doesn't mean she, she was also, she had been a part of, of the Communist Party in her youth, and that she had, and of course there were all kinds of leftists. Um, uh, okay, so this is the framework. So this is, explains why she avoids uh, terms such as alienation or even ideology, uh, because they're so connoted. Um, with, as a, uh, in, in Marxist vocabulary. So when she starts to work on the uh, project of Autoritratto, her idea is to look at the artist uh, as a figure of, um, as a possibility of freedom. Huh? So this idea of not being identified with the role is very complex and problematic in a way, because on one side, for her, the artist um, entails the possibility of liberation uh, and the practice that is not so important in terms of what it produces, the object, but in terms of um, his attitude 
towards social relations. Mm. And on the other side, and also because she's so much interested in those forms of art that, was, uh, that were uh, interested in uh, art as an experience, you know, in, the, in a relation between art and life, etc., all these 60s uh, uh, ideas. On the other side, uh, it didn't work, and, or, or it was problematic, because she's following, in a way, traditional ideas modernist ideas of the artist as not being identified as a worker, for example, and this is what uh, protesters in, in, eight, in, in 68 were pointing, you know, the artist, being, artist work being in a way subsumed mm, to, a lot, to the logic of production. So when she uh, does a ritratto, she's um, interested in that and the artist functions for her as a model of liberation for herself. Uh, so what she does is that the process of composing the book is a process of undoing the role in which she felt more and more alienated, uh, uh, the art critic, uh, this, um, um, how can I say, this, this idea of a written language, that this idea of a mediation between the artwork and the public, the idea that the critic is there to explain to the public the artwork or to judge it, to give it a price at uh, the Venice Biennale, etc., etc. She doesn't want to play that anymore. She wanted to be part of this creative moment, huh? which she also understands that is coming in this revolutionary time. Huh? And she understands artistic practice uh, as a way for her to free herself from a position of authority. So when Autoritratto is published, of course she realized that the artists are not ready to do the same with their own uh, identities, let's put it this way. So Autoritratto in the end became a um, source of uh, huge disappointment for uh, Lonzi because uh, because on one side she had undone herself in a way that artists were not ready to do. And I think this also uh, emerges clearly if you look at, the, at those group of artists and what they became in the 70s. And also, even more, the way they stayed as they were. I mean, the, they were avant-garde in the 60s, but then they never went into this uh, politicized moment that marked the 1970s. And I think there is a huge gap between what Lonzi does, that she follows the transformative potential that was open at that moment in a way that the artist she was close to didn't. If you look at those uh, arte povera, form of vocabulary is so, so much 60s still. I mean, if you look at Luciano Fabro's work or, or Giulio Paolini's work from the 70s and, and 80s, it still stays within a certain modernist or new avant-garde form of vocabulary. So she jumps into something uh, which was far more creative in a way, but and far more uh, timely. Mm -hmm. Uh, so this on one, on one side, so this moment of post 1968s also prompted her to realize that uh, things were maybe turned upside down, which means that on one way she realized how much, and this is something that she's uh, reflecting upon throughout the 70s until her dialogue with Consagra, how much an artist, instead of being this figure of uh, freedom, is the most alienated subject. Why? Because her entire time and activity is captured by the logic of valorization, of production, of success and competition, etc. No? When she has this um, dialogue with Pietro Consagra, she, uh, she never stops telling him how much everything he does is because of the exhibition, is because he has to meet the collector, all the people they are seeing together, it's because, you know, the galleries, etc., etc. Nothing is done just for the sake of doing it. You know? So, and on the, other, on the other side, then, she herself uh, becomes aware of her ambivalent position in this uh, relation. 
So, um, feminism becomes the, um, how can I say, the, the way for her to um, confer a political meaning to what she was searching throughout the 60s. And I think what she elaborates with, especially with autocoscienza, is really this idea of a practice of freedom. Huh? Uh, whose roots can be found in the way she understood art criticism and her relations with artists, uh, namely also these ideas of autonomy, of this idea of artists as, uh, as um, persons who are not identified within the social relations. This is something that becomes far more um, complex in, the fem in her feminist because whereas the artist was a kind of a mythicized figure for her, this process of withdrawing is understood precisely in terms of a process, an unfinished process uh, of becoming conscious of the ties that constitute oneself uh, within the patriarchal order. So, of course, this is always on the edge of going in different direction, because, because when she talks about the void, for example, what is the void? Uh, uh, what is authenticity? This is also a very important notion in Carla Lonzi. Is authenticity something that can be attained? Is it something that is already there? Is it something that we can understand as a process, etc., etc.? So this is a very complicated notion that she uses, and in my opinion, it's really unresolved. Uh, so, in a way, alienation is, uh, the figure of alienation is what she calls the vaginal woman, which means the woman who is petrified uh, within the, um, the apparatus uh, that contain her within, uh, you know, what is socially understood as femininity. I hope I understand, I, I, I answered your question. I don't think that for, for uh, Lonzi, alienation is in no way a productive force. Uh, uh, I suppose that's what can be uh, been expressed recently in, uh, in other feminist uh, uh, manifestos, etc. Alienation is, uh, is never understood as something that is productive. Alienation is another word of patriarchy, in a way. Uh, yeah. Can you maybe to say in what kind of way she's, uh, his, her notion or her theories are applied today in contemporary time? I, in Italy or maybe broader, I don't know. Um, well, I don't think that they are applied uh, <laughs> literally in Italy or elsewhere. I think that this, uh, parts of her uh, well, I think that there, there, is, um, there are some parts of, of her things that, that are very, that can be actualized, particularly her ideas of, uh, of the self as something, as a formation that is uh, in, in a process, uh, that is not a fixed formation, and that uh, her idea of a feminist subjectivity as something that is, um, you know, there is a constant working against what constitutes you. And I think this strongly resonates with some of the ideas that have emerged recently. I don't know, in queer theory, for example, there is a strong idea of uh, failure in Carla Lonzi, for example, uh, of the notion of failing to adhere or to comply to a logic of success, which is itself an exclusionary logic. Uh, or um, uh, there, are, there, are, there is also a certain uh, negativity in Lonzi's uh, feminism, which I think is very much um, that we can read from a contemporary perspective as a refusal to, uh, you know, to be recuperated within a neoliberalist agenda, for example. Uh, so there are different aspects that still speak today and I think that uh, explain the reason why her work suddenly is becoming so crucial. It's been translated in different languages and it's read again. Also this radicality of her separatism uh, in a moment in which uh, feminism is so much, um, you know, 
a contested part of uh, a capitalist agenda and it's used for uh, as uh, as weaponized in uh, neo-colonial policies etc this uh, impossibility to be you know this this more this uh, position of negativity in which Lonzi uh, locates herself which was very complicated to live at that time and which is still like a pro an unresolved problem I think speak to uh, as we try to imagine a feminist tactics that can escape those forms of recuperation that are so powerful today yes I was wondering um, it's really great to hear someone talk about Carla Lanzi, by the way, because it's so hard to get hold of her text in English. Uh, yes. I don't know, I think that's changing, you've said. But I was wondering, like, this idea of withdrawal is so complicated and so, uh, like... I was basically wondering how class maps onto some of her ideas, like withdrawal, was she very well off through this process of withdrawal from her career, her income, etc. But also, like, in aspects like the differentiation between the clitoral woman and the vaginal woman, you know, who has access to being a clitoral, clitoral woman and um, who doesn't, and uh, I don't know, I was just wondering um, uh, how she, like, survived, because <laughs> when you sort of, when I think about mapping her ideas onto the contemporary, um, the idea of withdrawal now is, is, is it's incredibly complicated and, 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 and increasingly impossible and her fantasy of the hippie is uh, perhaps also evaporated in, <laughs> in the contemporary um, like uh, all, all this like, idea of alternative um, recuperation is, is so quick now you know even you know queer is already um, being chomped up <laughs> and recuperated and mm -hmm. I'm just wondering I know that's a lot to ask. But <laughs> no, no, it's a, it's a very important question and I've also uh, thought about that. Of course, um, class is not an issue that she's elaborating at all and this is a huge problem in Carla Lanzi's writings. Uh, how did she live? Uh, I'd like to answer this question that it's um, very often posed to me when I speak about Carla Nozzi, she lived out of her contradictions, let's put it this way. She stopped working uh, and she was um, in a situation where she could do it. So she was a privileged person in a way, which doesn't mean she was particularly rich, uh, but she had men, uh, her, uh, um, the, the father of her son, probably, to whom she was married, and there was no divorce in Italy until uh, 73, I think. Uh, so people just uh, split, but they were still married. Uh, and uh, Pietro Consagra, who was a well-off artist, uh, so she lived like that, you know, which is, of course... Uh, so she could afford... Kind of she could afford... Really Totally, yeah, no, that's, I mean, you're pointing to a huge uh, problem. I wouldn't say the problem for me is, is not so much uh, from, uh, in material terms because, okay, so good for her, I mean, that she didn't have to work, but it's mostly in the way she, she's uh, not thinking uh, this condition. On the other side, um, I think that uh, the way she reflected upon uh, labor, for example, uh, still resonates today, even though it's maybe hard to apply. I mean, it, I think we should look at Carla Lonzis as um, someone who taught the forms of uh, women's freedom, and we can take uh, ideas from her writings without maybe uh, I don't know, maybe separating, you know, the way she practiced all this, or she tried to, I mean, in a way she tried to practice uh, a practice of freedom within the small group, but of course the small group was a very closed group, huge problems with that. Huh? On the other side, for example, the way she criticized um, the way life is captured by labor, 
it's still very powerful today, I think. I, in my book, I try to cautiously, of course, uh, think her refusal of labor to give it a Marxist stamp uh, in conjunction with what uh, um, the wages against housework were elaborating at the same moment. Of course, these were two very distinct uh, groups, famous groups in Italy, also the, fam the uh, wages Silvia Federici and Maria Rosa della Costa were uh, a more, much far more internationalist and they were connected to Marxist groups in Italy, namely Poteri Operai, etc. So it's a totally different story. But on the other side, uh, if you look at the content of the things that they are written in the first manifesto, or especially the way she elaborates on labor, uh, in her dialogue with Consagra, uh, you can find a similar understanding, okay, with all the differences uh, that exist, but a similar understanding of the way capitalism recuperates the affective uh, sphere and transforms it into labor. So what she uh, discusses with Consagra, for example, is the way their relation is put in the service of his career uh, and also the way love, uh, the, the most intimate parts of one's life is captured in this mechanism and how can you free yourself of it. Of course this is a huge failure for her also in her life uh, because it's the end of this relationship because this relationship cannot exist uh, in the terms she wishes for which are probably far too utopic to be real. Mm -hmm. But in the way she analyzes this mechanism, uh, maybe the difference and what makes it so um, fascinating is the way she's uh, embodying, in a way, this contradiction. Because on one side you have uh, people like Silvia Federici who analyzes a situation and, you know, but with the tools of theory and uh, Marxist theory, etc. And they, they draw, uh, how can I say, a picture of women's oppression, of women's affective labor and reproductive la labor uh, transformed and put into the service of capitalism and ends, etc. On the, on the other hand, uh, Lonzi describes the effects of it in one's intimacy in one's emotion, in one's uh, relations, in one's feelings. Uh, and I think this is quite unique, you know, uh, when we look at 1970s feminism, especially in Italy, this uh, impossibility to, to disconnect the two. Uh. So I think this is probably what makes it still so powerful today, because it has this subjective uh, uh, Part which is not so much present in, in the, the more like politicized feminism of her time. And this doesn't mean that we should uh, not take into consideration the privileged position in which she was, but even within this privileged position, she was struggling for something she could not obtain. So it was an endless conflict within the condition in which she lived and, you know, this aspiration which was probably uh, deemed to fail in her uh, personal life, let's say, but which was also like an opening of a horizon that was unthinkable. And maybe it still is, and even more now, probably. Probably our lives now are even more captured by those mechanisms, and, yeah. I have actually uh, two questions to do with okay, what conscienza, I don't know how to pronounce that very well. Um, um, the first question has to do with uh, Adorno's uh, negative dialectics. Do you feel that there is, uh, if, or rather, what is, do you have an opinion on whether there is something mimetic about her uh, trajectory of autoconscienza towards the void? Or, uh, or the rejection of instrumental reason. And also the second part or second question which I have is, uh, you spoke about conflicts uh, which arose in the women when they were participating in this. 
Mm -hmm. uh, what kinds of conflicts were there? Uh, were they the ones which um, sort of caused um, the discontinuation of this in terms of examples? Um, the conflicts, the which, uh, yeah, yeah okay. discontinuation mm -hmm. of, of this, because it sounds really performative, it could also be adapted somehow as an artistic in interpretation. Her, um, in, in today's contemporary world, if somebody were to uh, exact that right now, it would also almost be performative or somehow um, revelatory if it were performed. So I just want to have some understanding of what could cause those problems. Mm. Um. Okay, so your question about Adorno, uh, yes, you saw it right. Adorno is a very important uh, source for Carlo Lanzi. It's not something that I have explored, I have to say, uh, very deeply because uh, I, I wasn't so much interested in doing the genealogy of the notions that she uses, but uh, in her youth, in the early 50s, let's say, she uh, she was a Dorno reader. It was translated, especially Minima Morale was translated in Italy quite soon, and this was a very important book for her in some of her letters. In her youth, she says, this is the most important book I've read, etc. So there is certainly a um, genealogy of, especially the notion of uh, authenticity and the way she uses it, uh, goes back to Adorno. Uh, and also, I mean, she was very, I think that her, um, her formative years uh, are very important but, uh, in, in, uh, in her feminist vocabulary, but this is really something that is still to be studied. Yes, and also French existentialism. Also, she was uh, fluent in French, she spent some months in Paris, so she had read Sartre, etc., and also you have to imagine that such figures were very important for her generation. Now we tend to forget how important uh, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre was for uh, this uh, generation of, of course, Simone de Beauvoir, which she sharply criticized later in the 70s. Mm. Um, yeah, autocoscienza is... Um, it's difficult to... Um, speak about autocoscienza because uh, there are, I mean, the traces, the documents that we have are very fragmentary. Uh, uh, the, uh, the idea that I have uh, myself of autocoscienza mostly comes from what she writes about, so the way she experienced it, and from uh, scattered uh, testimonies of women that were recounting autocoscienza, but also in other groups, uh, because uh, it's something that was practiced uh, horizontally, but also not only in Italy, I mean, these this were women consciousness raising this group. Um, what were the conflicts of autocoscienza? It was the conflicts that one experienced in everyday life, I mean, the one that you can imagine. Uh, for. Uh, uh, Carla Lonzi especially, it was the problem of the position in which she says the others would put her as a leader and the conflict that she experienced herself with this position that on one side that she probably felt comfortable with or she uh, inhabited because she was capable to, or to write those texts, to conceptualize things in a way that not all the women were. And on the other side, her, um, her awareness of the fact that this position was a trap within the group's dynamic. So she's constantly, she's constantly struggling with and against uh, this uh, position, this, against the re-establishment of a role within the group. Uh. So you, can, you, you have to imagine that the autocoscienza group was supposed to be a group where there was no, no one was a leader, there was no judgment. Uh, it was very intense because uh, the, um, the relations were lived 
uh, and experience and how can I say expressed uh, in ways that can be could be very directed. Autokoshenza, from what I've heard from older friends that participated in those groups were also places where some of them said things that they had never said before uh, about how they felt or about the experience that they had and how can I say it? the idea is that there was neither like of course a judgment but there was none also not like a compassionate uh, forms of behavior it was more like a, experiencing this together. So this could be very difficult uh, for many of them. But I think that the conflicts were mostly uh, related to the, um, to the way the, the hegemonies, leaderships, uh, roles were constantly you know, reinstituted and, and how difficult it was to undo these dynamics that always represent themselves in collective situations. So it was really an experiment with the way of being together where you could reinvent also uh, the relations among women. And also you have to think that it was, uh, separatism was very much um, attacked by uh, political groups at that time. There is a famous uh, demonstration, one of the probably the first women-only demonstration in Italy, I don't remember the year, early 70s, there were groups of uh, men from uh, alternative left, like Lotta Continua, a very important leftist group at that time, Marxist uh, uh, extra parliamentary formation, etc., etc. They would attack the women's uh, group for wanting to march alone without them. So you have to also imagine that, that, that the, the, the whole idea of separatism was, uh, uh, was complicated. And I think it still is complicated. I mean, uh, if, if, okay, one, an, another way to look at this from a contemporary perspective would be, for example, I live in France and uh, the reaction, the extremely violent reactions that you have uh, when, uh, for example, uh, women from uh, African uh, origin or non-white women try to organize separatist gatherings in France, then you have the mayor of Paris declaring that this is uh, impossible, etc., etc. So it still provokes this kind of reaction from the hegemonic groups. Uh. So the attempt to construct this secure space for a circulation of, uh, uh, of speeches among women was very challenging in itself. And then once you're in it, uh, it's not so easy to, 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 to free yourself from all the, 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 the already existing uh, schemes, let's say. So this is probably the reason why Autocoscienza lasted really a uh, few years. Then other uh, groups like the Milan's bookstore group uh, adopted other forms which reinstalled some forms of authority. Like they did some uh, uh, practice that was called la pratica dell'inconscio, the unconsciousness, which is a form uh, of, uh, I don't know, wild uh, psychoanalysis <laughs> or uh, non, okay, the reinvention of psychoanalysis, but in, in which there was different positions and then the practice of entrustment, which again reinstates a form of authority relation. So autocoscienza was really kind of wild in its attempt to challenge all this and uh, ultimately it failed also because it was probably too difficult to um, to practice uh, on a longer term. Um, the performative dimension is really something that we can see from, uh, if, we, if we look at it in relation to uh, Lonzi's uh, experiment with autoritratto, with self portrait and if we look at it from a contemporary perspective. Uh, 
uh, it's not something that it was understood within the group as related to art in no way. Uh, this is a connection that we can draw maybe now, knowing the history, especially the way it was um, understood within the Rivolta Feminile. But uh, uh, even though there were many artists participating in Rivolta, uh, namely Carla Card, but also other figures of the art world, or many of those women were the partner of an artist, etc. Uh, they uh, understood art uh, maybe more as something that was external to what they were doing, as something they were struggling against, uh, but not something that was part of it uh, as a practice. I hope I answered your questions. <laughs>